to Scientist in Action, live from the International Space Station. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. We have a really cool program today. We're going to be talking about this. This is the International Space Station. There are seven human beings that do not live on the planet Earth right now, and they live aboard this space station. So today we're going to hear from our curator of space sciences here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Dr. Kachun Yu. And then we're going to move, we're going to connect with NASA. We're going to hear from some actual astronauts actually in space, which is very exciting. Um, during the program, those of you who are on-camera schools, please stay muted. I will let you know when it's time for you to come on camera. And when you do, walk up to your microphone and ask your question in a nice, clear, loud voice. And those of you who are off-camera today, joining us wherever, have a representative, if you're in a class, type your questions into the chat, and you can type them in whenever you think of them, and we'll keep an eye on them and try to get to all those. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Mitch. I'm a performer and educator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kachun Yu. All right. All right, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kachun Yu, and I'm an astronomer here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today, I want to um, give us an introduction to the International Space Station and what the astronauts are doing on board. And so with that, I'm going to switch over to some other software. And uh, let's see if um, I can get that to show up. OK, is it? Um, it's kind of tricky to because I'm running multiple programs, so let's try this again. Okay, here we go. So uh, this is whoop, keep switching back. So let me um, try doing this. We have a really finicky system here, so I apologize. So um, we're um, using um, some planetarium visualization software called Open Space, and it's something that's uh, funded by NASA. But um, this is a, um, a simulation of what it's like uh, to be on board the ISS. And uh, so if you're orbiting with the ISS, um, you'd be um, just over um, 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. And um, what's really important about the International Space Station is that um, it's an international collaboration, meaning it's not just the United States that's involved, but there are um, lots of other countries. So Russia, Canada, Japan, and many European um, countries are involved in building and running and sending astronauts to the International Space Station. And over the last 20 plus years, this is the largest object that we have ever put up in space. And, um, and the very first modules um, that were put up were actually the Russian ones. And they're the ones um, kind of in the back here. Um, let me see if I can zoom in. And um, so um, they're the ones off to the, to the right. Um, you, you can see that the, there are um, two um, large uh, modules, one with solar panels sticking out. And these were um, some of the first ones launched um, by um, Russia. And then subsequently, um, most of the other uh, modules have been put up by the U US using the space shuttle. And the largest modules are about the size of a school bus. So this gives you a sense of how big they are. And the International Space Station, from one end to the other, so basically from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, is about the size of a football field. So just over 360 feet long. And it's about 240 uh, feet wide. So, it, so it's pretty big. Um, as I said, the largest thing that we've ever put up in space, um, over 100 tons in size. And one of the amazing things about the ISS is that um, you know, we've been um, continuously um, having people on board for about 20 years, but those people are all relatively close uh, by um, to the planet Earth. So let's see if I can, um, I can't turn on an orbit, but you can see the International Space Station disappearing, and uh, it's, it's, it's only a couple hundred miles away uh, from the Earth. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to zoom away from the Earth. 
And so you can imagine the ISS hugging the Earth um, really close. And as we zoom out, you can see Greenland up there. And now we see a line that indicates the orbit of the moon. And so um, the moon um, is about a thousand times uh, further away than the International Space Station is. So all this time, um, all the astronauts that have been on board the ISS have been orbiting pretty close up. And um, we haven't sent people to the moon in, over, um, in, in just under 50 years, um, or over 50 years, but um, we are planning to um, send humans back to the moon in the next several years. So um, the, and, um, part of the goal of the ISS is not only to do scientific research, uh, um, but also to help underst uh, us understand how humans can live and work in space. And so that is uh, pretty important um, when we are talking about sending people uh, back to the moon. So with that, I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint. And um, let's see if I can get this visible again. Right, so that's our quick introduction to the ISS. And what we will then do, I have one more. A movie which actually shows you the assembly of the ISS. So the very first modules uh, were launched with Russian uh, rockets in 1998. And subsequently, um, they were added onto over the years. So you can see the years um, counting up in the bottom left corner. And like I said, most of the um, modules were launched using the space shuttle. And um, so we had dozens of space shuttle uh, missions. Um, the shuttle um, carried uh, each module inside uh, its um, compartment, its uh, cargo um, space. Um, the payload um, doors would open up and uh, the shuttle would use its um, arm to manip manipulate um, modules onto the space station. And as you can see, um, the um, station, as it added modules, it would move uh, modules around until we get to its current um, configuration. Actually, the current configuration is slightly different um, than what we'll see at the end of its video. But you can see how many missions and how many different modules um, have been added. Now, um, this is um, the space shuttle. Um, this, um, the space shuttle um, stopped flying um, over a decade ago in 2011, but this is the space shuttle on its launch pad. You can see the um, shuttle um, with um, two solid rocket boosters and a big external fuel tank that it's attached to. And once it's launched into orbit, uh, it drops off the fuel tank and it drops off um, those two solid boosters and now you see the cargo bay doors open. And so this is where the, um, the shuttle would hold onto modules for the space station. And here you see the shuttle docked to the space station. So um, there's a special docking adapter that connects up with um, a, another adapter um, on the space station. And once uh, the shuttle is docked, um, astronauts can freely um, mingle and go on board. Now, the other way that we um, sent astronauts to the space station is via Russian rockets. So here is a Russian Soyuz rocket, and the Soyuz rocket sends up a Soyuz spacecraft. Um, the Soyuz spacecraft um, can carry about three astronauts on board. So here you see one of them undocking from the space station. There's another Soyuz spacecraft off in the bottom right corner that's still docked to the space station. And uh, here is what the Soyuz uh, capsule uh, looks like. Um, it's um, a, a somewhat older design, but it's been a pretty reliable uh, spacecraft. Now, like I said, um, we retired the space shuttle in 2011. So we haven't been flying the space shuttle for um, over uh, a decade, over 10 years. And since then, we've had to rely on the Russians for rides up to the space, uh, for, to the space station. But um, right after the shuttle was ret retired, NASA also embarked on what they call the commercial crew program. And what this is, is uh, basically um, paying um, companies to help develop spacecraft. And in the past, this is what NASA did, but um, the spacecraft ended up being owned by NASA and they were run by NASA. But in this commercial crew program, what NASA did was um, when they paid these companies to develop um, their new spacecraft, 
to go up to the space station, the companies owned the spacecraft. And so NASA would continue to basically pay for rides um, up to the space station using um, these new spacecraft. Um, um, and, but um, hopefully they would be a lot cheaper than if um, NASA were to develop them uh, via the, the old way. And so it turned out that uh, this was, in fact, um, turned out to be a very successful program. And uh, in 2019, we had the first flights of the Starliner uh, spacecraft from Boeing and the Crew Dragon spacecraft from SpaceX. So just to um, quickly review, here is the Boeing um, Starliner. It um, has um, ba ba people basically sit inside the capsule when they fly up. And uh, you can have norm normally about four people on board, but they can carry up to seven people. Um, it sits on, on top of a Centaur a Atlas rocket. Um, and so this is um, also a, a pretty reliable um, rocket. Here you see um, a um, uncrewed or, uh, or a, a version of the Starliner without any people on board. And, uh, and this was launched um, in um, actually earlier this year in, in May. And it actually took up um, 500 um, pounds of cargo to the space station. And it took back 600 pounds um, to be brought back um, to the ground. So there weren't any people on board, but um, there is a plan to send the first astronauts on board the um, Starliner next year um, in February. Now, the, uh, and, and then here um, we see um, the Starliner landing. Um, so it lands with parachutes on, on the ground. Now, the, um, the, the SpaceX um, spacecraft called the Crew Dragon um, has successfully launched people um, into um, in, to the ISS. So here you see the Crew Dragon off to the right, and it launches on, on, uh, on a SpaceX rocket called the Falcon 9. Um, that's it uh, disassembled in the hangar. And here it is um, with the um, Crew Dragon mated to the Falcon 9 being um, pulled out of the hangar. And what it does is that transporter takes it to the launch pad, it um, puts it upright, and then the uh, Falcon 9 launches it into space. And so here you see it going up. And um, here you see the Falcon 9 um, with the Crew Dragon. And let's zoom in to the Crew Dragon. So the Crew Dragon, in some ways, is similar to the Starliner because it can um, normally um, carry about four um, astronauts into space, but it has room uh, for up to seven people. Um, there's a hatch in the front, and uh, there's also um, two portals or windows um, to the side, of, uh, to each side of the hatch. Um, there's actually a third window that we can't see, so astronauts can um, look um, outside um, via these windows. There are also uh, a bunch of smaller rockets, um, the so-called Draco rockets, which are used um, by the spacecraft to maneuver when it's in orbit. And so the way that um, the Crew Dragon gets up into space is that the, um, the Falcon 9 actually has two stages. Um, so there are actually two rockets that are attached to each other, other and after the first rocket, or the bottom stage of the booster, um, uses up all of its fuel, it detaches and it falls back to Earth, and it actually lands. Um, and then the second um, rocket then turns on, and it goes up into space. Um, it helps it boost uh, it into orbit until it runs out of fuel, and then it drops off. And then the Crew Dragon is basically um, by itself, and it uses um, the, the small rockets attached to its side, the nose cone also opens up, and there are um, also small rockets or thrusters inside that can help it maneuver. And basically what it does is it um, slowly approaches the International Space Station. And this can take anywhere from 12 to 16 hours for it to um, slowly get up there because you don't want to, um, when, when you're getting up to that orbit, you're moving at about 17,000 miles per hour. So you're moving almost five miles per second. That's how fast you're moving, so you don't want to um, go blazing in and crashing into the space station. So they basically um, come at it um, slow and steady. And um, the Crew Dragon um, actually approaches and docks automatically. So it has computers and sensors that allow it to find the space station and um, get it um, into position and then finally docking. Now the astronauts on board and uh, mission um, control down on the ground are monitoring um, all of this um, the whole time so that if um, anything goes wrong, the astronauts can take control. But for the most part, they let the computers take over. So 
here is um, the launch sequence. And like I said, um, the uh, first stage of that booster uh, falls off um, once it uses all of its fuel, uh, but it actually lands. And so let's uh, take a look at what that landing looks like. So here it is approaching a drone ship in the Atlantic and it fires um, booster, um, additional um, rockets and then it just lands. So this is one way that SpaceX has made um, space travel much more affordable because in the past, rockets um, would just be lost. I mean, the sh space shuttle uh, solid, solid rocket boosters did come down uh, via um, parachutes, but for the most part, the, one, some of the most expensive parts of rockets would just uh, be left to burn up or to land in the ocean. And here, SpaceX is basically recycling and reusing these rockets, so, um, so it basically makes um, rocket launcher launches a lot cheaper than they used to be. So here um, we're going to talk about Crew-4. So what Crew-4 means, this is the fourth crew to be launched to the space station using the Crew Dragon spacecraft um, on, uh, atop the Falcon 9 rocket. And so this is the logo or, or the patch that um, astronauts wear. Um, and so because this is um, the Dragon spacecraft, you can see the logo involves a dragonfly. Um, so the dra Crew Dragon spacecraft is in the middle of the dragonfly body, and you can see stars in the background. Um, and the dragonfly represents a, an, an insect that's very nimble and can fly you know, vertically and up and down um, and side to side. And so that's what um, the, dragon, um, the, the Crew Dragon spacecraft is able to do as well. So the, the logo um, um, sort of um, represents um, that nimbleness of the spacecraft. And um, we also see the Earth on the bottom and the Moon on, um, up top, and so this uh, mission is also supposed to represent some of the research uh, that will take place that will allow us to better um, understand how humans can eventually um, travel to the moon in the near future. So here is the Crew 4, uh, four crew. Um, there, um, there are four astronauts, and today um, we'll be hearing from astronaut Chell Lindgren, who is in the middle and to the right and he is the commander of the mission. So he's basically responsible for all phases of the flight and uh, from launch to re-entry of the um, Crew Dragon. But he became an astronaut in 2009 and, um, he, um, and he actually stayed in, on board the ISS for 140 days. Um, he has a background um, as a flight surgeon in emergency me medicine. So he's actually a doctor as well as um, having gone through the Air Force Academy. Um, and he's uh, been a friend of the museum. He's actually been to uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science um, and, and to give um, talks and uh, to give autographs to people who come to see him. The, uh, the person to, um, to the left um, in, in the picture in the middle is Bob Hines, who is the pilot of the Crew Dragon. And so he's the second in command and uh, he became an astronaut in 2017, so um, only about five years. Um, to uh, the person on the uh, far left is Jessica Watkins, who also has a Colorado connection because she actually grew up in Lafayette. Um, she ended up going um, to um, college and uh, becoming a geologist and working for NASA, and so um, and then eventually um, going um, applying for and then being accepted into the astronaut corps. And then the uh, the fourth uh, person of the crew is Samantha Cristoforetti who is the only non-American in this particular crew. So she's actually an Italian astronaut and she represents the European Space Agency. And she, um, uh, this is actually her second trip to the ISS as well. She and Chell um, have both been on board the ISS um, once previously. So she was on board for five months back in 2015. And, um, and she was a, a fighter pilot with the Italian Air Force before um, she was selected to become an astronaut. So here are the, um, the Crew-4 astronauts in their SpaceX um, spacesuits. Um, like I said earlier, uh, because NASA is basically renting uh, rides on board the SpaceX um, spacecraft, um, they, uh, SpaceX also provided the spacesuits. And so these are, you know, um, if you uh, might have remember what spacesuits look like um, for the shuttle astronauts, or in previous missions, they um, looked very different from this. And so SpaceX specially designed um, these spacesuits uh, for, um, this um, for their spacecraft. 
So um, now we're going to have a uh, video that we're going to uh, play showing um, <coughs> the <coughs> what the crew did uh, before they launched because SpaceX and uh, Tesla are run by Elon Musk. Um, the astronauts get to uh, be driven to the launch pad in Tesla um, electric vehicles. So um, here you see uh, the Dragon uh, or the Falcon 9 on the launch pad. They take an elevator up uh, to the tower and they, they walk um, a flight of stairs. And here um, you see um, Chow and Bob, uh, Bob um, walking through the crew access arms to um, to get on board the spacecraft. And, um, and then here you see the ground support crew um, getting the astronauts ready. And if you look behind Jessica Watkins, you can actually see the NASA logo with a bunch of signatures. And so every astronaut that's gone on board a Falcon 9 um, SpaceX launch has signed that wall back there. And here um, Jessica Watkins is um, getting on board. And the spacesuits um, aren't, um, you know, they're pressurized, but they're um, not um, solid enough for people to go into space um, in them. Um, but they do protect astronauts in case there's an emergency depressurization. And so the um, oxygen and communications do um, plug in to the spacesuit um, somewhere in the thigh um, region. So once they're seated, they, um, they're, they're kind of seated um, looking forward now, but um, when um, the, the hatch closes, the seats actually rotate up so that they're looking upwards. So now you see the um, crew access arm pulling away, and then we're going to um, see the launch in just a few um, seconds. We're jumping ahead. Here's mission control uh, for both the launch as well as the International Space Station uh, because um, obviously uh, they need to monitor both uh, for this mission. So here um, we can listen to the countdown seconds. and you can count down in your cl cl classroom if you want to. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. So this is a nighttime launch or an early morning launch. This is off 54, 4 a.m. Eastern time, and this is 2 a.m. in Colorado. Now this is the camera attached to the first stage. So this is the stage that will drop off. And this first stage has nine engines. You can actually count nine um, rocket exhaust plumes coming out of there. And now that first stage has actually dropped off. And so uh, you, um, on the right, you're seeing the second stage engine firing. And now we see um, the first stage booster actually landing on that drone ship. So again, this is super early in the morning. It's dark, but the, um, the rocket engines are lighting up that drone ship. So we have a successful landing of that uh, first stage rocket booster. And now um, we see the astronauts on board the, um, the, the spacecraft and they have this plush turtle toy that's floating and they use that to um, let them know um, when they're actually in weightlessness. So otherwise, um, you know, they can't, don't want to unstrap to find out, but um, they use that toy to, to, to do that. Okay, all right, um, so um, I think uh, we're ready to take some questions from uh, the schools out there and uh, Mitch is going to help me and I haven't uh, been hearing any audio in here so uh, maybe some, someone can make sure that I'm getting audio in here. Oh, all right. Everyone, we just want to let you know that we are talking to the astronauts live. So as soon as they're ready for us, we're going to switch over. So that might happen in the middle of the sentence. Just want everyone to be ready. Uh, now, first, we'd like to bring up one of our on-camera schools, the uh, Galileo School of Math and Science, Lars Wagner's class. If you want to unmute and ask a question. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't hear that. Can you repeat or step closer to the mic? How much do astronauts get paid? I actually don't know how much astronauts get paid. That would be um, a um, question that uh, could be directed to um, the astronauts. So unfortunately, I don't know that um, a the answer to that. But that's a great question, um, Amelia. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, if you um, look at um, the astronauts who reply and who actually get into the astronaut corps, they um, tend to be um, the very best of the best. And so um, all these um, astronauts have gone to at least um, college, meaning they have a four-year degree. And many of them have also gone to additional schooling. Um, so Jessica Watkins has a PhD in geology from, I think, Stanford. And so she is a bona fide scientist. Um, a bona fide geologist, um, and um, Chell Lindgren um, went to the Air Force Academy um, for his um, college, uh, but then afterwards he um, went and got a, um, a medical degree from um, CSU, um, Colorado State um, University. So, um, so you know, if you um, are interested in becoming an astronaut, um, you should definitely um, think about you know ch um, planning to. Um, to stay in school and getting at least a, a college degree uh, because um, you'll be competing against a lot of other people who will have college um, or advanced degrees. Uh, but that's a great question. Thanks for that, Emilia. Well, thank you. And of course, uh, the Air Force Academy is located just a little late from here, so that's a big part of our town. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. Okay, have I ever been to space and what was the second part of the other question? Okay. Um, well, I have not been to space, um, so, I, um, so I can't um, say, um, you know, I can, I can tell you exactly um, what it's like. But um, there, uh, it's estimated that just under 600 people have been into space as astronauts. And um, so um, until very recently, um, being an astronaut um, has been you know, very difficult, and um, they tend to choose, um, they tend to be very picky about who um, they uh, select. But um, now that um, there are, are more companies that are sending people into space, um, it has become um, a little bit easier, although it's still very expensive. So uh, perhaps um, you know, if you um, decide you wanted to become an astronaut, um, there are definitely ways for you to get into, this, uh, into space in the future either by becoming an astronaut, astronaut or uh, figuring out a way to, get, um, to pay um, to get in, into space. All right, All right. Um, let's I think, move on uh, to our next for... school. All right, okay, and if we you. can move over to the New Vision Charter School and Lisa Easton's class, if you want to unmute and ask your questions. Okay, is the question, um, will the moon become habitable? Is that the question? Uh, it looks like Kachun is I, I didn't muted. Quite hear. Uh, I don't think it was your fault. It's on our end. <laughs> Was the question about wh whether the moon will become habitable? Is that the question? All right, I think you're muted on our end, unless there's, there's something wrong over here. 
Okay. Um, hello? Is the audio working? Yeah, it looks like Katoon is muted. Uh, we're going to figure that out. But the question was, do we think the moon will become habitable? Which is a very cool question. Okay. Um, was the question um, whether um, the moon will become habitable? Is that the question? That's right. Okay, well, um, right now, if, if that is the question, I didn't quite um, hear um, the question, but um, if the, the question is about whether the moon will become habitable. Um, currently, the moon isn't uh, very habitable because there isn't any air or accessible water on the moon. It's a very dry and desolate place. But um, we do find a lot of evidence that there might be ice locked up in the rocks and in the soil underneath um, the lunar surface and hidden away in some craters um, where the sun um, hardly ever shines. And so um, one of the goals of the future uh, missions to the moon is to explore some of these regions. And I hate to interrupt, but we have heard from space and the astronauts are ready for us, so we're gonna go to NASA Hello, right welcome. now. My name is Standing Kate Nath, and I'm the virtual programs coordinator for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We are thrilled to have you joining us today as we connect live with the International Space Station. The cosmos has long inspired humankind, and today, the chance to speak to astronauts living hundreds of miles above Earth's surface is just a further testament to how far human knowledge and science has come. In preparation for today's program, we had students and potential future astronauts from across Colorado pose questions for the scientists aboard the space station. In a matter of minutes, these questions will be answered live. And so, without further ado, we would like to thank NASA for this incredible and unique opportunity and turn the program over to them and, of course, the International Space Station. My name is Anne Eason. How do you become an astronaut? Thank you for that uh, question, and uh, I just want to say uh, uh, at the very beginning here um, how delighted uh, that uh, Jessica and I are to join you all at the Denver Museum of uh, Nature and Science, um, and we thank you for this opportunity. How do you become an astronaut? Um, I think uh, the bottom line, it requires hard work, but uh, if you are a pilot, you need to have a thousand hours of, of flying time in high performance aircraft. And uh, many of our pilots come from the military, from the Air Force, Navy, uh, Marine Corps. And then if you are a mission specialist like, uh, like Jessica and I, you need to have an advanced degree. You need to study extra hard. And, uh, um, and it, that degree needs to be in the areas of uh, science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, Jessica is a geologist. I'm a uh, physician. Position, and uh, we both, uh, uh, it's an extreme honor and privilege to, to get to serve our country in the capacity as an astronaut. Hi, my name is Annabelle. Where does your water come from? Yeah, great question. So we have um, amazing technology on board the International Space Station, um, which we actually are able to apply on the Earth as well, um, and we'll be using in the future as we explore further and further into the solar system. Um, but that technology allows us to use the moisture that's in the air um, and from our bodies and recycle that um, water in turn into drinking water. And so we are at the point where we are able to recycle about 95% of the water that, um, that we produce here on station, um, which is amazing and is going to be super helpful for us when we start going out to the moon and eventually to Mars, where we won't be able to resupply with water from Earth as easily. And so it's a really important technology to be able to create uh, drinking water. And so we end up at the end of the day, we end up with water that can go into a drinking bag, like the one that Chell is showing you here, and uh, create water for us to drink. It's delicious. My question is, how do you sleep in space? So I'm still recovering from the water question. Um, how do you sleep in space? Well, the easy answer, I think, uh, for me is really, really well. And uh, we sleep in sleeping bags. Our sleeping bags are on our crew quarters, which are actually just behind us here. And uh, 
I have my sleeping bag just tethered to the uh, crew quarters with one cord, and when I get into it, I will get into my sleeping bag, and then I'll just float around in my sleeping bag inside my crew quarters. And uh, for me, it's like sleeping on a cloud. I'm Addy, and my question is, what is your favorite thing about being in space? That is a tough question um, because being in space is awesome. And so I actually have two answers. My first favorite thing about being in space is getting to see the Earth. Uh, so getting to look out our window and see the Earth uh, rotating beneath us, getting to see everyone we know, everywhere we've ever been, um, just, and we get to see that um, 16 times a day. So the Earth um, rotates, we get to see 16 sunrises and sunsets every 90 minutes um, up here from the International Space Station. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and my second favorite part about being in space is getting to be up here with my friends. Um, we have amazing crewmates. There are uh, four of us here in, on Crew 4, Chell, myself, Samantha Christopheretti, who's working hard behind us, and uh, Bob Hines, who is um, working hard over here here. Um, and so getting to work with them as well as our Russian colleagues um, is just an absolute honor and privilege. Hi, my name is Gabe and um, my question is, what does it smell like in space? Hey Gabe, that's a that's a great question, and when I, this is my second mission, and when I got back to the space station, um, it smelled just like I remembered it, and that is uh, the the smell of space. So once we have a, a vehicle, a, a spacecraft that is docked with the space station and has just been exposed to the outside, or when we bring a spacewalker back into the um, into the space station, it has this kind of a burnt metal smell, and so every time we open a hatch and and uh, are are welcoming a new spacecraft you smell that smell and that has a very distinct smell and I've never really smelled it uh, back on the earth and so it was really cool to get back here to the space station and to experience that smell again. Hi my name is Ibrahim and my question is what if debris damaged the space station Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually, there is a whole team of people on the ground who are fully focused on the answer to that question and really to avoiding that scenario um, for and keeping us safe up here on this International Space Station. Uh, so that team is looking out for any pieces of debris or any particles, satellites, anything in space um, that might be have a similar trajectory um, that would intersect with our trajectory up here on the ISS. And if that uh, looks looks like that might be happening, then there, there are several things that we can do. Um, the main one being that we can just change where we are. So we can change our orbit, and that way that deconflicts us from anything that might be on a similar pathway so that we don't end up colliding. So we are super grateful um, and super reliant on a whole team of people that keep us uh, safe, and, safe and productive and happy up here. My name is Dara, and my question is, what would happen if your tether broke on a spacewalk? That's a, it's a really good question. We have to be very careful when we're doing spacewalks, and so we spend out hundreds of hours practicing spacewalks in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory back in Houston. And that's, uh, we learn how to be very careful about using those tethers. And so hopefully what would happen is that we'd be holding onto a handrail and we'd notice that that tether broke. And uh, so we would stop using that and, and start using a different one. Um, if for some reason we were not holding onto the space station at the time and our tether broke, we have another tether called the safety tether that is holding us to the space station. If both of those tethers are broken, we have one last safeguard, and that is that we have a jet pack on the back of our spacesuit called the Safer. And this is a uh, essentially cold gas uh, jets that we have a controller to fly ourselves back to the space station, and we actually practice doing that using virtual reality back at Johnson Space Center. We have great trainers on the Earth that prepare us for all of those um, possibilities, and so we're very grateful for that training. Can you show us a backflip in, in space? We're glad you asked.
You got a double out of Chell. Hi, my name is Allison, and my question is, what do they eat in space? Allison, food is incredibly important, um, not only on the ground, but uh, up here in space as well. Of course, we are all taught and we know that we need to eat a, a, a balanced diet that includes um, protein and vegetables. And so our food comes in two different ways up here. One is it's sealed in this kind of a greenish aluminum envelope. This, all of our food is pre-cooked. And so this is food that has been cooked on the earth and then sealed in this envelope to keep it fresh. And when we're ready to eat, we stick it into a food warmer and it warms up. The other type of food is dehydrated food. And so here are some veggies um, that have been rehydrated. These are asparagus. And so I'll be, that, that'll be for dinner tonight. And those are kind of fun things. Th those are things that we need to eat to stay healthy. And then every once in a while, it's okay to, to have a little bit of, of a treat. And so here we have uh, some candy coated, um, can candy coated chocolate peanuts. And uh, we really like these. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> One more. And we like to have fun with those. They're tasty and fun. Hello, my name is Bryce, and how does it feel before you take off? Yeah, that is a super exciting super fun, super overwhelming moment, uh, sitting on the launch pad, getting ready to finally launch. So we have uh, years of training prior to a mission like this. Um, when we first joined the astronaut corps, we have two years of essentially basic training where we get introduced to, to all of the thing, all of um, space station systems, um, robotics, and, and learning how to fly jets as well. Um, and then when we um, learn that we are going to be on a to a mission. We have specific training uh, for that mission as well, and that can be anywhere from, from one to two years. And so when we're finally sitting on the launch pad in our seats ready to go, um, after all of that training, all of that buildup, it is just um, super exciting to have that culmination of, of really of, of a dream that's been, uh, for me personally, um, something that I've dreamed about for a very long time. Um, and then also the excitement of knowing that it is just the beginning, um, that it is a launch into a, a up to the International Space Station and that um, we're the adventures that we're going to have up here. So it is um, a very, very exciting moment having all of that come together at once. Uh, my name is Luca and my question is how do astronauts walk in space? Luca, that's a really interesting question. Um, and we learn to, when we say walk in space, of course, walk, that very specifically means putting on our big white spacesuit and going outside of the space station. But we have to get around inside the space station as well. And uh, to do that, we can use our hands and our feet. And so you can see these blue handrails. Um, we grab onto those to, to move around. And those are on the floor too. And that's actually, we have our feet tucked under handrails to keep ourselves in place. And so we can push off of those. Um, we can pull on these. And uh, so when we f you first get into weightlessness, you first get on the space station, you're kind of clumsy. And you propel yourself and you run into things and you knock things off the wall. Um, but after you've been up here a while, you become very efficient at moving around. And you can get from one place to another just by grabbing one or two handrails and turning yourself and rolling and doing a flip and ending up right where you want to be. And it's really, really cool. Hi, my name is Camilla. And my question is, have you ever dropped or lost something in space? Uh, the answer to that question is absolutely. Um, almost every day, um, I I lose something in space. It is it is really um, quite different up here um, to to keep track of everything. So when we are working on a task and we have several tools and materials that we are um, working with, it can be really difficult to to keep them all in your vision. Um, we can let go of things like this microphone, and it will generally stay where you put it. But after um, of some 
period of time, the air current in the space station will pick it up and, and take it away. And if you uh, are not paying attention and you turn around, it can be gone forever. So we spend quite a bit of time looking for lost items, but they always show up. My name is Sean, and my question is, what games do you play on the International Space Station? Well, one of uh, the games we frequently play is I Spy, when we're looking for stuff that Wadi has lost. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, there are a lot of things that we like to do in our free time on the space station, but uh, I think most of all, um, we love looking out the windows, looking back at the earth, and we love hanging out with each other. So um, those are the two things that we probably spend uh, most of our time on. Uh, we like, we have a, a, a voice over internet protocol phone um, through our computers so that we can call our family and friends back on the ground. And we really enjoy talking with them and catching up with what's going on on the ground. Uh, but we also have uh, an assortment of uh, various sports uh, equipment up here, mostly just uh, to kind of have fun with, but uh, every once in a while, it's really fun to see stuff and how it behaves in space, things that we're very familiar with. Uh, uh, Jessica was a, uh, um, is a rugby player and played on the nation, U.S. national team, and so it's fun. I know it's fun for her to have a rugby ball up here and see how it behaves uh, in weightlessness. Hi, my name is uh, John, and my question is, um, how do you guys deal with the gravity on the International Space Station? Yeah, so microgravity is actually one of the, the most fun aspects of, of being up here, but it definitely takes some adjusting. Um, as Chow mentioned, when we first arrive, you are your body is trying to figure out how to how to work, how to think, how to move around um, in microgravity and how to use the, the full 3D, the full, uh, full volume of the space here on the ISS. Um, and it's amazing to see how, actually how quickly that happens. Um, it really is just in a, the first couple of weeks where your body Body really starts to figure it out um, and your brain starts to map out the station in, in all different orientations um, and it really becomes um, quite easy to maneuver around and, and um, work in this space so um, it's been pretty awesome to see that happen. Um, my question is what kind of exercise do you do? Exercise is incredibly important, not only on the Earth, but here on the space station as well. So when we're on the Earth, we try to exercise every day. It's uh, important for our muscles, for our bones, for our hearts, and it's um, even more important on the space station because being here in weightlessness, while it's fun, it's actually very um, hard on the human body. The human body adapts to it, and it's as if, because we float, because we don't have to fight against gravity, it's as if we were just laying in bed for six months straight. And of course, our bodies would become very weak if we did that back on the earth. And so here in space, we have to uh, do exercises to keep our bones strong, our muscles strong, and our hearts working well. And so we have an exercise bike and a treadmill uh, for cardiovascular, for an aerobic workout. And we have a uh, essentially a weightlifting machine, a resistance exercise device that can provide up to 600 pounds of resistance um, to keep our muscles and our bones strong. And uh, so we work out about two hours every day. And uh, by doing that, we're healthy and strong when we return back to the earth. Hi, my name is Jennifer. My question is, how long does it take for your body to recover when you come back to earth? So I think it really depends on the individual person. For my last mission, um, you, well, let's just say there are a bunch of different things going on when you get back to the earth. And, and uh, for one thing, your inner ear that helps you with balance, um, you feel a little dizzy. Your inner ear is a little messed up. Uh, the vestibular part of your brain is, is a little messed up because now it's sensing gravity again. And that takes about two weeks to go back to normal. Um, our muscles, our bones, our bodies are not used to uh, 
to gravity. And so for me, holding my big head up on my neck, uh, my neck has not had to do that for six months. And so when we get back to the earth, my ne your neck is sore, your low back is sore, uh, your, your feet are sore because, again, they're not used to holding your, your body up. Um, that all gets better in about 30 days. So in about a month after you get home, you're feeling pretty much back to normal. We at the museum would once again like to thank NASA and the astronauts aboard the International Space Station for making today's program possible. We would also like to thank the audience joining us, as well as all the students and families involved in filming prior to this program. May you continue to find inspiration in space, science, and learning. We look forward to seeing what comes next for humankind and space exploration and hope some of you will be the astronauts making that happen. And uh, we would just like to say thank you to all of you, our friends at uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, to Kate and Jessica and everyone who helped put this together. Thank you to the parents and, uh, and especially thank you to the students. Uh, we hope that uh, you had fun. We certainly did. And we look forward to you continuing to explore uh, there at the museum, but also on your own, reading about science, technology, engineering, and math, reading about space flight. And uh, we hope that some of you will uh, come and join us and explore with us at NASA someday.